Hey everyone, in this video I want to look at the anatomy of Azure Policy, how it's structured and how we use it. As always, this is useful, a like and subscribe is appreciated. Now when we've adopted the cloud, there's been a huge shift. Before the cloud, if I as a user wanted a resource, well, there was me and I would make a request. Now that request would go to the admin. So the administrator of my resources could be the hypervisor administrator, the system admin, they would look at my request and providing it met the requirements of the company, any regulatory requirements, they would then go and actually do the create. So they were the safeguards. If there were guardrails I required in my environment, well, everything went via the admin who had the ability to create things. Well, things have shifted. If we now look at the cloud, well, when I create something, I don't go via the admin anymore. I actually go directly and I do my create but I still might have those same requirements for guardrails. I have that same need to enforce certain regulatory requirements. So how do we do this? And the way we do this is, assuming this is Azure, the reality is when I'm doing that create motion, what I'm actually creating via is the Azure Resource Manager. So that create isn't really going directly to that cloud, that create is actually going to the Azure Resource Manager. And that create is happening regardless of what tool I'm using. So if I am the user, if I'm using the portal, if I'm using PowerShell, if I'm using the CLI, if I'm using a template, no matter what it is, it's going via the Azure Resource Manager. And the Azure Resource Manager, well that interacts with various resource providers that then define the exact resources we can have. So what I want, if I have those guardrails, I want something that sits here at this Azure Resource Manager plane, which everything has to go through. There is no way to bypass that. And this is where we think of Azure policy. So a number of things are enforced here, role-based access control, controlling the permissions, the actions I can take on certain scopes and certain resources. And then Azure policy are those guardrails to control, well, what are the types of resources we can use? What are the configurations we're allowed to have? And so Azure policy is sitting right here. It's enforcing no matter where the request is coming from. And it understands Azure Resource Manager and interacts with certain resource providers as well. So this is what we're gonna focus on. How can I use Azure Policy to really enforce those requirements we have? And of course, I draw the idea of Azure Policy against ARM, against resources in Azure, but also remember one of the big things we have today is this idea of kind of ARC enabled. ARC enabled infrastructure, ARC enabled Kubernetes. And what that ARC enablement does is, hey, it takes that Azure control plane and takes it to other clouds. It takes it to on-premises. So when we think about this Azure policy, there are aspects of it that will also apply to these ARC enabled resources. If I'm doing a guest configuration, hey, that applies to guest operating systems in Azure. It applies to ARC enabled servers. If I'm doing policy around Kubernetes, well, hey, once again, that's gonna apply across these. So don't think of this as only Azure resources because ARC enablement extends that Azure control plane elsewhere. Well, these Azure policies gonna apply there as well. So let's really dive into, okay, so what is this Azure policy thing? So we can really think about, I don't know, what is wrong with the board these days? It doesn't move properly at all. So I try this, oh, there you go. So it's better if I switch modes, there we go. So if I switch modes, 
then I can actually um, do things a bit better. All right, so now I've lost that ability. So what is an Azure policy? So when I think about Azure policy, it is a JSON format. And the goal is I'm gonna create this structure. So I'm gonna think about, okay, it's this JSON document. And I can do many different types of things. I might say, hey, I wanna to restrict to certain locations. I want certain tag values. I only wanna use this type of SKU. There's a whole set of different things I can do. But we're gonna start off, if we just write the idea of an Azure policy. And it's broken down, <laughs> gonna get tiresome really quickly. And it's broken down into different parts. Maybe it's easier to go and quickly go and look at one. So what we'll do is we'll jump over and we'll actually look at a policy. Now we start off with defining. So we create a policy definition. And we'll just open up a very, very simple one. So what I could do is I could quickly search and I might say, hey, allowed location. So there's an account allowed locations. And here I can see this definitions tab. And what it's starting with, we can see are some properties. Everything's misbehaving today. So I have this idea of properties. We can see, hey, look, a display name. We have a description. So these are fairly obvious things. Hey, it's the name of the policy and then a description tells me what it's doing. Then we also see this idea of a policy type, i.e. built in. So when I have the built in, this is one provided and maintained by Microsoft. I might also see the idea of custom. So if it's custom, it's one I've created. So I can obviously go and create my own policies. There's a massive number built in but I can also go and actually define my own if the ones built in or the ones available elsewhere don't meet my exact requirements. Now I'll also sometimes see a value of static. If I think about certain regulatory compliance, well I just need an attestation by Microsoft, so it's Microsoft managed, that you meet this particular thing. Maybe it's a certain type of control. So we'll see some, and I'll show you one later on, that is just static it's not really evaluating anything, it's that Microsoft are attesting, yes, we meet this particular regulatory requirement item that you need, so I might see that. So we have this idea, and then we also have a mode. Uh, we have indexed and all. Obviously, all is everything. Indexed are only resource types that support tags and locations. So that's gonna be super useful if I have a policy that's enforcing something about tag or location, because I don't want it to try and apply to things that don't support those. So it's a way to really restrict those down. Then there's various metadata elements I can have. So I can start off with my Azure policy. Hey, I have those various properties. And obviously that metadata, that might be useful to track version, for example. Now, if I'm creating my own, well, the definition has to exist somewhere. So we also have this idea of a definition location. So if I'm gonna go and create my own one, and we'll look at this super quickly. So this is a built-in one. And for the built-in ones, there is no definition location. It's just available anywhere. But if I was gonna say, hey, let's create a brand new policy definition, the first thing I have to do is tell it a definition location. So it's showing me my management groups, so I can pick at a certain management group I want this policy definition to be created. I could optionally scope it down to an individual subscription if I wanted to. Now the whole point of this is when I define this definition location, it will only be available at that location and the child resources. So when we think of, okay, there's a structure in Azure, we always have this idea of, well, there's the Azure AD. So we have our Azure AD tenant for our organization. 
And then under that structure, well, we have management groups. So there's always this idea of a root management group, but then I can create a hierarchy of my own management groups up to kind of six levels deep. Maybe I've got dev, prod, and then underneath there, we will actually go and create subscriptions. So I've got a particular subscription. I can obviously have multiple subscriptions. And then obviously within the subscription, I go and create actual resources inside resource groups, like multiple resource groups as well. So that definition location, wherever I define that, could be a subscription, could be a certain management group level, I can only use it at that level or below. So I wanna think about, hey, what is that definition location to make sure I'm defining it at the right level if I'm doing a custom one so I can use it where I want to use it. So it's only resources at that level or below could actually consume it. And then we have parameters. Now you might say, why do I need parameters? We're just defining right now the policy. So remember the whole point of the policy is a set of rules, it's conditions on when this should apply, and then there's gonna be some effect. Well, I'm gonna define this policy and I'm gonna assign it at certain scopes. Well, I might wanna have one policy, but maybe use it in different ways. And maybe it's restricting something or requiring a certain tag or restricting to certain locations, but depending on where I assign it, those restrictions may differ. Maybe it's a different set of VM SKUs. Maybe it's a different tag value I want. Maybe it's different locations I'm allowed to have. So the whole point of parameters is when I do the assignment, I can change the value of those parameters, which will then change the conditions and the things this policy is going to do when it gets assigned at that various level. So, hey, I can have different options depending on what I set when I do that actual assignment. Um, now these can just be values. I can also configure things like allowed values. So I could define an array of allowed values that you can then select from. I can set a default value. There's also strong types. So a strong type is something like a location. That's something understood by Azure. I'm gonna get a richer experience when I'm actually in the portal using it. There's also other ones. Um, let's go and look at this. So if we go and look again, and in fact, while we're looking at allowed locations, that's a nice example. So we can actually see there are parameters in here. So it's giving me a list of allowed locations. So when I try to assign this, I'll have to tell it the list of allowed locations that I want to allow that this is gonna enforce. So it's an array, and notice it doesn't give me a list of possible ones, but it's a strong type of location. This is something natively understood by Azure. Now there are other strong types. If we go and look at the documentation, we can see there's also resource types, storage SKUs, VM SKUs, existing resource groups. So I have those options available to me. If I was to hop out, and let's look at a different one. So I'm actually going to look at my ones that I have deployed, just to make it easier for me to find allowed storage SKUs. And if I view the definition, one of the parameters, again, is storage SKUs. So it's only gonna let me have those valid values that can be a storage SKU, and I can then go and select from it. But also an interesting option I have now for my parameter is the effect. So this is the end result when I have my Azure policy, which we're gonna talk about. Now I've got here a list of allowed values. So I can tell it to audit, deny, or be disabled. I have a default value, of deny. So here, when I was assigning this policy, I have to tell it the effect. So this is super useful that maybe when I'm first deploying a new policy, I wanna be careful. 
I can do a lot of damage with policies by maybe denying the ability to create something that I didn't really mean to do. My scope was wrong, my logic is wrong, and I suddenly break people's ability to deploy. Well, here, I could initially deploy an audit mode. So I can see, well, hey, what is it really deciding? What, what is it doing without actually restricting? And then once I feel more comfortable, hey, then I could go and actually turn on the deny once I'm feeling good that I'm not gonna make some huge, huge, messed up configuration in my environment. So I'm gonna be able to use these parameters later on in my rules. So I have n parameters, whatever I want with those various attributes of them. Then of course, I want the ability to actually have all well, my rules. And I can really think of the rules as the conditions. So the rule is gonna be made up of the idea of the conditions it's gonna check. I can think of this as really an if then. So if, hey, the, the conditions I'm checking on, and then, hey, some effect that I'm actually going to do, which we started to see some of those already. Now, what I can do is there's various different things I can do as part of these conditions. I can get very, very rich. I can have various combinations. I can have various logic. I can have multiple different conditions I want to check. And then within those multiple conditions, I could say, well, I just need one of them to be true or, and that would be an any of. I might say I need them all to match. So it's all of an and condition. And I can do things like not. So I can invert the condition result. So let's go and have a look. So what we'll do this time, because if we was just to look at this particular rule, I can see here my policy rule. So it's the policy rule and it's an if. So this one is all of. So this is and, I need all of these to be true. So I'm looking at a field so my field is the type, so the type of the resource, and I'm doing an equals operator that it needs to be from the Microsoft.Storage resource provider, and it's of type storage account. So this is fairly obvious. Hey, I'm looking at, I want to match this on storage accounts. So it's type has to match storage accounts. And then if it's not, so I'm gonna inverse the condition. If the SKU name, is in the parameters list of allowed SKUs. Notice I had a parameter which was the list, so I'm referencing the parameters that I passed and the parameter name called list of allowed SKUs. So if the SKU name property of the storage account is in the list of allowed SKUs, and I'm saying not, i.e. if it's not in the list of allowed SKUs, which means both of these would be now true because I've inverted, because it wasn't in it, it would be false, and I'm inverting it to make true. So I'm doing an if, all of, in this case. But also it could be any of. There's different things we can do. But in this case, I'm looking at the field and then have those conditions. Uh, let's take a different one. So this time, I'm gonna go and look at my audit VMs that do not use managed disks. And we'll click the view definition. Now this time notice my rule is any of, but remember I can actually do nesting. I can create groups of these. So it's any of, and then it's a particular group. So if I zoom out for a second, you can see it actually creates this group here and then it creates another group, it's gonna go down here. So it's any of these two different groups it's actually creating. And what it's doing in the first one, it's basically looking for, hey, if the resource type is a virtual machine and exists a field called osdisk.uri, i.e. it's not using a managed disk. So this time using exists. It's not checking the value of it. 
It's just saying, does this field exist? I, is it using a non-managed disk because it has an OS disk URI? So it has to be all of them. So it's a virtual machine and it exists a property OS disk URI. Or because it's got an any of, or, okay, well now it's looking at, it's of type a VM scale set and then any of. So it's using an OS disk VHD container or it's got that image URL. So we can see there's various combinations, various nestings I can do with those ands and those or behaviors to essentially in this case, hey, either it's a VM with an OS disk URI or it's a VM scale set with an OS disk VHD container or an OS disk image URL. See those any of and all of and all those combinations we can do as part of those policy rules. So there's many things we can do as part of that. And there's a huge number of these conditions available to us. Now, one of the other things we can do here is there's really just so much power as part of this. I can look at the individual fields of resources, and this can be super useful with, for example, tagging. So if I jump out of this, and what we're gonna do now is we'll actually look at the definitions. Now, tags by default, um, they don't inherit. Many things in Azure inherit. So for example, when I look at this structure over here, if I set a policy at this level, it gets inherited down. If I set an R back, it gets inherited down. A budget gets inherited down. If I set a tag at a subscription, it does not get inherited to resource groups and the resources within. Tags don't inherit. But using Azure policy, I can actually change that behavior. So if we jump over here, and there were some built-in ones to do exactly this. If I say inherit, here we go. So we can see here, inherit a tag from the subscription if missing. Inherit a tag from the resource group. Inherit from the resource group if missing. So let's just go and look at one of these. So we'll look at, hey, inherit from the resource group. So in this definition, we have a certain parameter, which is the tag name, the one we're gonna check for. And then our policy rule is, well, it's all of the field now it's concatenating tags and then the parameter tag name. So it's looking for the specific tag that I've passed as a parameter. So environment, so tag square bracket environment, close square bracket, for example, is false. And hey, if it is there and the resource group tag is not blank, so realize what it's doing. It's saying, hey, I need both of these to be true. I need this tag value I'm passing to not exist on the resource. And the same tag, I need it on the parent resource groups. We're using this resource group function cannot be blank. So if the resource doesn't have the tag and the resource group that it belongs to does have a non-blank value for the tag, well then we're gonna do sync. And in this case, we're gonna do this effect modify, and we're basically gonna add it. We're gonna add from the resource groups, so the value is gonna be the resource groups tag value, and create that tag on the resource. So essentially we're copying the tag from the parent resource group. So we can do some really nice things here. Now, one of the interesting things about that one is you'll notice there was this idea of a role ID. And you're probably wondering, well, what, what was that all about? And we're jumping ahead a little bit, but because we're modifying. If I'm modifying, well, it has to modify as a certain role. In this case, it's this B24988AC, blah, 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 blah. Well, we can always jump over and look at these. If I do a get AZ role definition, and we'll sort it by name so we can find it easily enough and format it. Table as name, ID, auto size. This will dump out all of them. 
and I already know which one it is. So if I scroll up and find contributor, well, there it is. So contributor is that B249. So it's running it as contributor rights. I can pretty much do anything except sat ACLs. Now there's a huge number of different things we're actually doing here. And one of the questions you may have straight away is, well, okay, there's all these different fields that I'm acting on. Um, okay, so this is tags, but all those different rules are looking at different things, different um, attributes. What are the ones I can actually look at? Like, how do I know what I can do? So we're not really directly looking at the property. It seems like we are, but the reality is when we're actually looking at these various like fields, for example, and types and these skew dot name, these are actually aliases. So these are aliases, which are properties within a specific API version. And there are a huge number of these and they are constantly growing. Pretty much anything useful is gonna get exposed to you. But if I was to do a get AZ policy alias and list available. Now, this is gonna be hideous. There's gonna be so, so many of these. And I can actually scope this down. So I could scope this down to particular namespaces. So I could do dash namespace match compute, for example. Oops, available, it's weird. Um, so I can scope it down to be something more useful. Something you're more likely to do than to actually use like this is there's actually an add-on for VS Code. I don't know why that is erroring. Get AZ policy alias list available. That worked on us earlier. I don't know what I've done wrong. Uh, actually, we try and scope it down while we're just looking at this. So if I do a get AZ policy alias, and I'll try that more useful thing, namespace match compute, and look at the aliases. And then it should show me just once for compute. This works earlier, I'm obviously doing something silly, but that should show you what all the aliases are. But again, what's nicer, oh, there we go. So there I can see all the different names of the things I can look at for the various types of resource, and there's a lot of them. But that add-on for VS Code is really a nicer experience. I can just go and install the add-on, then as I'm working on my template, it will tell me, hey, these are the aliases you can actually use. So that's really far more useful than trying to look through and scroll through that list. So we have the rules, we have the conditions, and our conditions have various different ands and ors and inverts and other types of checks we can do on those various aliases we have available. And then we have an effect. So we have this idea of, well, what do we wanna do? And there's a lot of different effects that we can leverage as part of this. So the first effect is just disabled. Don't evaluate this. It's not getting evaluated. There's append and modify. So with append, what I'm doing is I'm adding to an array field. Maybe I'm adding an IP to some list of allowed IPs, for example. Modify, I can add or remove, um, replace properties or tags. So I'm modifying some attribute of the resource itself. I can do deny. So hey, I'm trying to perform some action and based on those conditions matching, I won't be allowed to. And remember, this is no matter which way I'm coming into this, the portal, PowerShell, CLI, script, DevOps, doesn't matter, I'm gonna deny it. And then there's audit. So it would let it happen, it wouldn't stop the request, but I can track the compliance of those things. And then additionally, what I can do is there's an audit if not exists. And also a deploy 
if not exists. And the idea of those is it's tracking some existence condition, both of these, so audit will actually then audit. Deploy if not exists will actually execute a template as a certain role definition. We saw this already and perform some remediation to actually make something right. So don't think of templates really even just as the guardrails. Yes, we can track compliance. Yes, I can enforce certain things, but I can also maybe fix certain things. I can actually do remediations. So let's jump over to the portal. And what we'll look at this time is if we jump back again. So we already saw that kind of tag idea where it ran as a certain a role ID. But this time if I search for, um, let's see, deploy, oh, let's look at my definitions. So if I search for deploy and log, there we go. So deploy log analytics extension for Linux VMs. So we look at the definition. I have various parameters, a particular workspace that I'm gonna connect this to. And notice this is a strong type and it's of type OMS workspaces. So it's gonna give me a list of the workspaces that I can select from. I can add an array of image IDs to include. It's gonna include in the scope of things that I want to check by default, it's gonna be blank. And then my rule, so remember it's all of well, the type is a virtual machine, and then any of, well, either the image ID is in the list of image IDs, or it is a certain image publisher and a certain image offer, and then a whole list of versions, or it's SUSE. So it's gonna go through a whole list of things that match. Like, when should this rule apply? So we can kind of see, well, it has to be a VM. And then once we know it's a VM, it either is from a certain list of images or it's from these certain publishers and versions. There's a whole list of stuff to see. Now then my effect, my effect is deploy if not exists. It's a extension and it's gonna run as this 92AAF0D, this whole long one, which I'm pretty sure, and before I kind of showed you that PowerShell to list them out, the other way is there's an article. So what we can do is, hey, I can take this role ID and we can just go and search for the built-in roles. And I'm pretty sure it's the log analytics contributor. There we go. So it's gonna run this as a log analytics contributor. Now it has an existence condition. So these things match true. So all the conditions did here was confirm it's a VM and confirm it's of a certain Linux type based on either the image or the image publisher and kind of the versioning. So it's making sure it's Linux. That matched, so now I have, well, I want to deploy if not exists. So now I have an existence condition and it needs to be all of these. It needs to be, well, I'm looking for the extension type OMS agent for Linux. And then, hey, the publisher equals enterprise cloud monitoring and the provisioning needs to have succeeded. So I'm looking for all of these to exist. If these do not, i.e. this fails, because remember, what is my effect? My effect is deploy if it does not exist. So my existence condition is looking for the extension and it to have successfully deployed. That's really what it's looking for. So if this does not match, then it's gonna go and do the deployment. It's an incremental mode deployment template, and it's essentially gonna push out the agent, and then a whole set of attributes and properties for that template deployment. But here we can see some pretty nice, rich things it's doing. So I'm actually going through 
And yes, we had those same sets of ideas around the conditions, but the condition was just finding it, okay, where do I wanna match a Linux VM? And then my effect then had its own set of those existence conditions to decide if it should then perform this action. So hey, find me the Linux VMs and then check these existence conditions and if they don't match, then I'm gonna do this other thing. I would audit or I'm actually gonna go and deploy this template to remediate the thing. So there's some really powerful things that I can do there. Now, also, you notice I kind of drew the, they're in an order. This is the order they are actually evaluated. And the logic is, hey look, if it's disabled, okay, I'm not, I'm not gonna bother doing anything else. Um, let's look for append modify things next because these might resolve something. They might go and add a tag, for example, because later on there might be a policy that denies if the tag doesn't exist. So let's do the append and modifies first because maybe we make it right and then we'll go and look at denies. Or oh, and then after it's not been denied, then we can go and audit. I don't wanna bother auditing if it's been denied. So there's a logical set of things that happen. And then the whole point is if, all the, if the effect essentially is good, so the condition is good, well then, hey, I can go and audit and deploy to go and do other things to maybe go and remediate. So there's kind of an order, it actually runs these things. Now we've really been focused on this idea of ARM. So we draw this idea about the Azure Resource Manager and there's these various um, aliases and all these things we can interact with. The reality is there are some special ones. For example, there is a guest configuration. Some of these resources we might have are virtual machines. Well, for virtual machines, I can actually do guest configuration. And once again, this is gonna apply for the Arc enabled as well. So if I think about things like guest configuration, i.e. things within the operating system. And the way this is gonna work is it's using PowerShell DSC, desired state configuration, I think it's version three. And then if it's Linux, it also uses PowerShell DSC, but it also uses the Chef Inspec. So these are all kind of these declarative technologies to say what I want something to look like. Well, so it uses those to apply down what it wants something to look like, so we can then track a compliant state. So I'm actually doing the ability and, and also stop things. So I'm doing configuration on those. So I have this ability to do guest configuration through Azure Policy. I can do things like Kubernetes. And what Kubernetes is doing is interacting with Gatekeeper. And through the Gatekeeper, it can, again, go and assign policy, it can track various compliance things, it could enforce certain things. There's things about Azure Key Vault. I can go and enforce it. So there are certain special things. If we go and look at some of these super quickly. And one of the nice things we can do is there are categories. Now when I create my own, I can add categories to it. But if I take out this search, what we'll firstly do, if I can actually get that to go away, instead of doing all categories, well let's start with the idea of guest configuration. So these are things Hey, look, audit Linux machines that have the specified applications installed. So here we would totally expect parameters. Hey, look, do we want to include Arc machines? That's pretty interesting. And then the application name. And what is our effect? Audit if not exists or disabled. And so what this does, hey, if it's a VM, it's a certain image publisher, It's ignoring certain things. It's got a whole set of things it's doing down here. Carries on. Again, these are all about, well, does this apply or not? It's doing a whole bunch of checks on various things. Then, well, my effect is whatever I passed, because maybe I disabled it. Maybe I'm doing that audit. The type is looking at Microsoft.guest configuration. So it's using a guest configuration assessment 
and this time it's the not installed application Linux. So it's a specific guest configuration capability that it's using um, to go and check that. So we're doing those various compliance checks. Also, I can do things like Kubernetes. So on Kubernetes, maybe I'm looking for, should not allow privileged containers. So notice my mode here is microsoft.kubernetes.data. So it's a certain resource provider, not just ARM. This is actually using the resource provider. And it's going to now go and integrate with Gatekeeper to enforce this. So there's different configurations here because it's actually going to go and, again, it's still got the various checks. We have the effects. And then we're using this particular template, a container no privilege v2 template.yaml, to now go and configure things through Gatekeeper to enforce things on our Azure Kubernetes cluster. So we can see, yes, there's basic Azure policy that applies to ARM, but then we have the idea that, well, there's also these special ones for getting richer integrations with certain types of resource. So fantastic, we have Azure policy. And Azure policy lets me do these definitions of various things that I could then use. And that might be absolutely what we want. But very often, I'm gonna have multiple different policies that I wanna apply as part of some all up set of configuration or some all up tracking of compliance. So I don't wanna to have to track them all individually. So optionally, I can also use the idea of, so that's Azure policy, I have the idea of an initiative. And I can add policies and number into an initiative. So this initiative then gives me the ability to have those grouped together. Now, once again, my initiative has certain properties. It can have various um, parameters as well, because I might define certain parameters of the initiative that then get fed in to the parameters of the policies that are contained within it. And then I have those n number of rules within there. And we can show this. So if we jump back over again, what I'll do this time, instead of looking at definitions, we can change the definition type to initiative. So I'm only gonna see the initiatives. And we see there's a whole bunch of these. And notice we can see this policies column that tells me how many policies are in it. Now as a best practice, even if you had a single policy, they actually recommend creating an initiative. I'm just putting that in it. So then in the future, if there were other policies, I could just add it to the initiative. I wouldn't have to do reassignments. It would just automatically start taking effect. So some of these don't have very many in it. Configure Linux machines to run the AMA agent. Okay, well, there's four policies. I can see, hey, there's certain parameters within there. I could create my own. When I create my own, once again, I have to do a location for it to be stored. I give it a name, description, a category, and then I would add in the policies that I want to be part of it. And then I would specify initiative parameters. Let's just add a couple of policies. So let's just, I'm randomly, this is gonna be gibberish. But I'll just add a few in. I could group those within the initiative, maybe around certain areas. But I'm not gonna bother creating groups for now, but it would help me with the visualization of where I'm kind of got various compliance states. I could create a parameter, test, test, no strong type, do I want a pull review, no allowed values, I'm just gonna do save. So I just got a string. And then my policy parameters what I could do here, now I could see the various parameters I might need as part of the actual policies within the initiative. And what I could say now is, well, hey, I wanna use an initiative parameter 
that I configured so I could pass those things through. I could set a certain value. So I could either use default values if it existed, I could set a specific value, or I could pass through the parameters I configure on the initiative, if that's what I need to do. So once again, I can now use that initiative in different ways depending on what I have. Now, one of the things I talked about earlier was this whole idea that there were built-in, there were custom, and then there were static policy types. If we look at this NIST SP800, it's actually a good example because it's got a massive number of policies as part of it, as you can see by how long this is taking. So if I click this Microsoft Managed tab, that's why I can't see them, you'll see all these Microsoft Managed controls. So these are all Azure policies. If I click one, so notice the policy type, static. So this is not actually looking at anything really. This is just a testing for something that Microsoft manages that yes, Microsoft implements this access control. If you look at the policy rules, it has to be all of the following. It has to be the resource type is in subscriptions or resource groups and false as to equal true. Uh, well, that's never not going to happen. False very rarely will equal true. And so it's just going to audit. And what will happen is because this potentially won't apply, you're going to get a successful tick because it won't apply to any resources. To show this, I added or assigned that particular check to my subscription. So if we look, I have this Microsoft managed control down the bottom here, and you can see I'm compliant. And I'm compliant because it's zero resources. If I go and click on it, it's been checked. I'm 100% compliant, so I'll see, yes, I'm good on this particular measure. So I can see, hey, control 1005 account management, because it doesn't apply to anything. There are zero resources this is gonna to apply to because if true equals false, we have bigger problems. And so that's what those static type are. It's a way for certain compliance offerings to attest that yes, we have this. And this is how the compliance offerings in Defender for Cloud work. If you actually go and look at the definitions and you go and look at the initiatives, you'll actually notice like the Azure security benchmark that we get and all those recommendations is powered by an initiative. It's there with 204 policies in it. Then all those other ones you have, SWIFT, PCI, Canadian Federal, all those initiatives and compliance offerings you add through Defender for Cloud, they're just initiatives that will get applied and then it's using all of these configurations to go and check and then make recommendations to actually leverage them. So that's what's happening. So initiative lets me group them and then, well then we need to do something with it. So that really becomes the next part. So hopefully this is making sense so far. What is a policy? Policy really is just defining a set of conditions. If they match, they're true. And remember we can use not, so if something's missing or bad, then we have an effect. Disable, append, deny. It's very common to stop you doing something in a bad region or a wrong skew. Or we might deploy if not exists. It's a good idea to group them into initiatives. That makes it easier to both do the assignment we're about to do, but also track our compliance status. I don't want to have to look at 950 policies to track my compliance. I want to look at the initiative and say, oh yes, I'm compliant. So the next thing I have to now do, I have to do an assignment. So yes, I can assign a policy or I can assign initiative. So I'm going to do an assignment. And I can assign essentially any of these levels. I can assign at management groups. I can assign at subscriptions. I can assign at resource groups. And it gets inherited. So if I assign it at this MG1, whatever policy I configure here will apply to the dev management group and all the subscriptions under it and all the resource groups under it and all the resources within. 
So it would be a very broad set of impact I have there. So what we really think about is when I assign policies, the higher up the hierarchy, they're really only things that are really absolute apply to everyone. They're fairly broad in scope. They're the absolute must have everything. As I start getting closer to resources, I can give it more specific. Like I don't want to be super careful of doing something like no public IPs. Because well, maybe I need public IPs for certain types of resource and it's very hard to override. There are things I can do and I'll, I'll talk about those. But these do get inherited down. Now, as part of this assignment, there is an enforcement mode. So I have enforcement mode. And I'll show you that quickly. So as I jump over and we go and look. So now I want to actually go to my assignments. Now, one way I can do an assignment, you can see I have a number of them here. And notice I have this whole idea of the Azure ASC default here, which is part of the whole Defender for Cloud initiative to, to scan my environment. I can assign a policy or assign an initiative. Likewise, if I was looking at a particular policy or initiative, and I've just selected it, well, I can hit assign from here as well. So there's multiple ways. And obviously I can do this through code. I can do this through other mechanisms. Obviously I typically wouldn't use the portal. But when I go and do an assignment, I set the scope. So hey, I could assign it a management group. I could optionally do it a particular subscription. I could optionally do it at a particular resource group. So I pick the specific scope of what I want to do. But you'll see at the bottom, we have a policy enforcement, enabled or disabled. When I'm starting off with a new assignment, a new policy, it's a good idea to do disabled. So what disabled means is I can really think of disabled as that what if mode. It's not going to be enforced during any kind of create or update operation. It's not going to create things in my activity log, but it will go and look at my existing resources. I can then go and look at well, what's the compliance state of wherever I've applied it to. Is it having false positives? Is there some broader impact that I wasn't expecting? So doing that enforcement mode to disabled is a really, really good first step. It is a kind of safety blanket to make sure I'm not doing something. And then I could tweak it before I actually then actually enforce it, which is really important if the policies are actually doing things like deny, because I'm gonna have a pretty bad thing. Now, as part of that intelligent way to assign things, I would start off, we like that parameter option of the effect. Maybe I would start off in audit mode. So again, I'm not gonna block things that maybe I didn't mean to. And it's really important to educate the users, give descriptive descriptions of whatever the policy is doing so users can maybe understand, okay, I'm getting, I'm getting these flags, I'm getting these warnings, these audits. So let me do it still, but you don't want users to just be surprised why one day when you actually do switch it to deny, once you hit a certain percentage threshold that you feel comfortable with, like, why am I getting denied? So make sure there's a user education as part of this, so not just, caught off guard. So I can tweak it. So I can start off enforcement mode disabled. Then when I enable, I want to be doing audit down here. So when they create the resources, they'll see kind of these various things. Then I can do deny. So I'm going to go and track the compliance, track the policies, make sure I'm really doing things. Now as part of the assignment, maybe that public IP one, maybe there are particular prod DMZ subscriptions that should. So one of the things I can add is not scopes, i.e. exclusions. If we go and look again, so I could apply it at a fairly broad level. Let's say I set it as a management group, very high level. But do you know what? I want to exclude 
Maybe it's a particular subscription. Maybe it's only a particular resource group in that subscription. Maybe it's only a particular resource. So I can actually go through, I didn't mean to click that, but I can actually go through and exempt things. I can say, look, I'm applying at this scope, but I'm gonna add this exclusion. So when this applies, what this effect would now be is it would not apply to this VM that I put in the not scope. So I can apply at a broader level and then I could exclude certain resources from it. So this exclude, this not scopes, is part of the assignment. It's at that level. When I'm creating the assignment, or I could modify it in the future, I think I can have 400 um, exclusions. So there are limits. If we go and look at the regular Azure subscription things, we can see, and if we look at exclusions, not scopes, I can have 400. There are also limits on, hey, initiative definitions in a tenant, and other things to be aware of, and this document is linked in the description below. But essentially, I can have 400 exclusions. Look at nested conditionals, 512 in a rule. That would be hideous. But I'm sure some of those ones that dealing with looking at Linux SKUs and versions, there's a lot of different things it has to go and check for in there. So those can get pretty big as well. So we have this idea of not scopes. That's really powerful as well. That does let me maybe apply at a more broad level, but I do have a few exclusions where, no, no, I, I don't want it to apply at these particular scopes. I can have multiple scopes. And again, the not scopes will include everything under it. So if I did a not scope of this resource group, it'll be everything inside the resource group. If my not scope was the sub, it'll be everything inside the subscription. So there's different things I can use in there. Now, when I think about this assignment, and obviously the great thing about the assignment is then if I go back and change these, it just automatically takes effect. I can assign in other ways as well. So one of the common mechanisms we have is blueprints. So blueprints enable us to combine resource groups and ARM templates and role-based access control and policies that stamp down on a subscription, for example, when it's starting out. And I can deploy that in different ways. Hey, it's do not delete, it's read only, or it's just setting some initial list. So I could also deploy it with blueprints. I could deploy it as code. And I've actually got a separate video where I talk about doing everything I can do in a blueprint with code. I can absolutely apply and do these assignments with a template. So I don't have to think about doing these as separate things. My DevOps pipeline, my ARM template, my bicep file, my Terraform. I could also assign policies if I wanted to do those things there as well. So there's many different things that can happen. So when I do that assignment at whatever level I want for whatever I'm defining, it's not instant. I think it can take up to about 30 minutes um, if there's a new or updated resource, it might be a 15 minute, but anytime there is that um, new resource, if it's a new policy or initiative assignment, if there's some scope update, and then by default every 24 hours, it will go through and reassess. And remember we're doing this for different reasons. Yes, absolutely. Now obviously if it's deny, that's, that's gonna deny as I'm trying to do something. As I try and perform some resource, it's gonna deny it. And we could see that. So if we jump over super quickly, let's look at something we have denied. So let's go and look at our policies. Let's actually look. Notice you've got non-compliant messages. There's all things I can define. And I can set the parameters for my particular assignment where I have those in my initiatives or my policies. But if I look at my assignments, so let's look at allowed locations. So my scope is the entire subscription. And if I look at my assignment, so it's a list of allowed locations. And if I look at my actual assignment, the parameters, I selected, because it was a strong type, it's given me this nice, 
experience here. Okay, Central US, East US. So for example, I cannot deploy to, I don't know, let's just pick one, UK West or UK South. I can't deploy to those. Additionally, if I was to look for storage account SKUs, and if I edit my assignments, notice I can change these things. I can't use premium ZRS or standard ZRS, so I can't use ZRS. So if I was to try and really quickly create a storage account in that subscription, and I'm just gonna type absolute gibberish, and I'm gonna target UK, And that is straight away, it's denied. So there are certain things now lighting up in the portal that even as I'm trying to do it, it's validating as I'm putting these things in. And I'm gonna change it to ZRS. Let's go through. Basics missed something. What am I missing? So if I let's fix this one then. So that is actually checking live. I can't get past it. So we do South Central. So that's fixed. It's running a validation and it failed anyway. This time it failed for allowed storage account SKUs. So we can see that experience and the user could go and click on this and get more information. So it's right there in full. So one of the things is that deny is super powerful. But then also just in general, for compliance. If I go and look at my compliance state, hey, I can go and get nice information about my resources. Maybe it's not about denying, maybe it's about just tracking my overall compliance and I wanna see what's happening. Now you'll notice over here we have this idea of events. So one of the things we can also do is when there's a state change, I can think about, hey, the compliance state is created, changed, deleted, something's happening to something that's changed its compliance state. Well, I can do events around that. And the way I'm gonna do events around that is an integration with event grid. So event grid is phenomenally powerful that it has various sources for events, in this case, Azure policy, then it has event handlers. This could be an Azure function, an Azure logic app. I could send it to an event hub, a storage queue. Whatever I wanted to do, I have an event handler. So now, hey, if something comes out of compliance and I can do configurations on this, I could go and do something. Maybe it's alerting someone. Maybe it's running some script to go and do something more sophisticated than I can do with just the regular deploy if not exist type things. So I could do other things automatically. Now, the other thing we do have is I drew this idea of not scopes. So I could exclude certain things. There is also something called an exemption. Now the exemption, rather than modifying the assignment, the exemption is created as a child resource of where I create the exemption. And this is really useful, for example, Defender for Cloud. Defender for Cloud has that whole set of policies it applies. Well, maybe one of those recommendations it's giving me is maybe, hey, you need an anti-malware solution. Maybe I have one already. It's just not the one that Microsoft is looking for. So I want it to stop saying I'm not compliant. So I can create an exemption for that particular policy, maybe at a certain level, so it stops flagging that as non-compliance. It won't count against me in my overall compliance score. Now, I can create this exemption as, as different types. It could be mitigated, I, I'm achieving it a different way, I have my own antivirus solution. Or it could be a waiver. Maybe, hey look, I know um, I'm deleting this stuff later on, stop, it's for a special use case. I could set an expiry time on it. So then I actually have an exemption on this particular resource. So if we jump back over, so this time, let's go and look at our compliance again. See so if I want to look at my allowed locations, I can see there's some non-compliant resources here. Well, I could go and create an exemption. I could specify 
the exemption name. Is it a waiver or is it mitigated? I'm doing it another way. Does it have a certain expiry time? I could go ahead and configure that. So I have this ability to go and create the exemptions. Now, if they're ones from, for example, Defender for Cloud, what we'll see a lot in the recommendations, for example, you can see all these different I got these options available to me. I can add an exempt. So from right here, storage account public access, I could go and add the exemption from within Defender for Cloud as well. So this is using that same capability. This is how we do it for the Defender options. Hey, waiver mitigated. So then I could go and add whatever one it is. I should give a description of why so I can track this for compliance status. But now I can get an exemption and it will stop counting against me for that. Now obviously this is, this is fairly powerful. Um, and so from a permissions required, you do need this Microsoft authorization policy exemptions, uh, both read and write. So that's the resource policy contributor or security admin or the owner has those. Now note, in addition, because what this sounds like, hey look, if someone set a policy at a management group level and I'm the owner of my subscription, I could just exempt myself. Well, you can't. Because as it talks about here, there's an extra security measure. In addition to needing the policy exemptions ability, I also, on the assignment itself, at that scope, I need the uh, assignment exempt action. So I would have to have a role, it could be a custom role, just with the assignment slash exempt slash action. I have to have that at the scope the assignment was assigned at, i.e. the management group. So even though, yes, I might have full owner or resource policy contributor or security admin of my subscription or resource group, I also have to have that exempt action for the assignment at the scope of the assignment. So that stops people exempting themselves from things that have been set at a higher level. Now another way of doing this, let's say there are certain resources, I'm creating these templates, these policies, and I do want maybe a nicer way to, there. sometimes I want an exemption, but I don't wanna to have to do the not scopes, I don't wanna actually do, hey, add an exemption. Well, as part of the definition, if you know you have something, but you also know maybe there's certain resources you're gonna want to exempt, for example, well, you could always consider, remember it's a combination of different things. You have these various rules within there, like policy rule, or if field type is in these. You could always add a check for maybe a certain tag. I could add this idea maybe, let's find a different one. Um, so this is like all of. So I'd need an all of set of conditions, but I could add the idea of maybe I have a tag bypass policy. So I could think about adding to this, oh, let's duplicate that definition. I could create my own version and I could add this idea. And so what does this do? Well, it needs to be all of them, remember. And tags bypass policy has to be false. I.e., if I had a tag called bypass policy existing on the resource, it wouldn't run this policy. It would skip it. So there are just different things you can do potentially that, that might be nicer. So that's kind of that all up anatomy of Azure policy. Um, there's a huge number built in. There are landing zones at additional ones. There's actually a great community. So on GitHub, there's this community policy where people go and create policies. Uh, one of the nice, there's, well, there's a huge amount of nice things over here, but like for tags, there's some clever things you could do. Hey, add the date created tag. And if we go and look at what it's doing, well, it's basically saying, hey, look, if a tag name, so I, I have this idea, then 
It's using a certain role definition. I think that was the contributor we saw earlier. Could be wrong. Add the tag name, and it's going to use hey look substring the time now slash substring. It's basically going to go and add the date. So someone has gone and created this nice rule that will go and add the date for us. So as I create a resource, it automatically goes and adds the creation date to it. So that's really powerful. So definitely recommend going and having a look through here. It's pretty unlikely you have to go and create your own policy from scratch. There are just so many out there. The chances are someone has done what you wanted. So I would look at what's built in. I would look at the landing zones. I would look at that community. If you do find you have to create something totally unique, find one close and you can duplicate and base off of that. Use the initiatives. Start off carefully. We think about that enforcement mode disabled at first to get an idea of what if, what is it gonna do? When I start actually having effects, we'll start off with the audit mode and start off with a smaller scope. Yeah, we wanna build up our confidence. It's not gonna do something terrible. So we start off with a smaller scope then we can broaden out the scope and then we can kind of switch to deny. So think of safe practices. I'm not gonna do some terrible thing to my environment. Deny is always dangerous in a way. There might be scenarios where there's some automated process that it can't create a tag. So just be aware there may be times you have to do some kind of not scope or hey, you want those abilities to skip certain things. But that's it. I mean, really the whole goal of Azure policy, it is, is that guardrail. It's that guardrail for the environment. It can be used to track compliance of resources. It can be used to enforce by actually doing things like deny. It can be used to remediate by having that kind of deploy if not exists. So it's super, super powerful. I hope this helped give some idea of how it can be used. Um, as always, a lot of work goes into creating these. So I mean, the like and subscribe is appreciated. But uh, good luck in your Azure policy endeavors.